Good morning and welcome to this course in Geopolitical Risk. My name is Joey Jakobsen, I'm Professor in Political Science at NTNU and I will guide you or try my best to guide you successfully, uh, hopefully, uh, through this lecture series uh, in Geopolitical Risk. Of course, this is the coronavirus edition really of the course. Um, I had to volunteer, I felt I had to volunteer to do it digitally due to the uh, limitations on, on the group size and limitations in terms of space at, at the university. <clears throat> now, uh, I will get back in this lecture to some of the formalities, some of the things that have changed due to the special circumstances um, but I'll try first, or I'll, I'll first I'll, I'll uh, deal with um, the course topic itself. What is geopolitical risk? Um, so this is basically an introductory lecture where I'll kind of ease all of us through the basics. Um, at the same time, and at the end of the lecture, I'll, I'll uh, deal with some of these formalities. I'll also provide plenty of examples of geopolitical risk events uh, in this lecture. Um, normally, I hold two-hour lectures, live and face-to-face, and, -face and and I'm watching the students now, of course, I'm watching a computer screen, which is uh, kind of strange for me. Hopefully I'll get used to it, um, uh, you know, in later lectures. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's special circumstances. Um, anyway, normally I hold two hour lectures. I think I'll kind of um, chop this first lecture uh, into several smaller pieces, shorter pieces. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, another thing is that the lectures will be in English due to, you know, this course being offered also to exchange students. Uh, there are fewer of them this year due again to, to the special circumstances. Um, but there are a small handful and so we'll proceed in English and we'll, uh, the written information is in English and, and etc. Okay, now I'll show a PowerPoint which I will also post on, uh, on Blackboard, which is the program we use. Um, <clears throat> in addition to Panopto, which is the program that record, uh, records my lectures. So, if we just begin with the basics, and this is really the basic, this is Poll 1005, Geopolitical Risk. As I said, I'm, I'm Joe Jakobsen, belonging to the Department of Sociology and Political Science. I'm a political scientist, formally uh, by training, um, I know that many students do not belong uh, to po the political science department, which is perfectly okay because, and not least because uh, the topic of political risk and geopolitical risk uh, is really, <clears throat> it really crosses over to, to other areas. It's not only about political science. And myself, I'm really, um, focusing mostly in research and teaching as well on international relations, which is a subset of, of political science. And this class has really moved throughout the years and now belongs more or less primarily in international relations, international politics. But I'll get back to this as we go on. <clears throat> okay, first of all, Political risk in very general terms, very general terms, can be described as the impact of politics on the market and on market actors. That's a very basic definition and it's really a catch-all definition because uh, defined like this, almost everything can be regarded as political uh, risk. <clears throat> it 
from institutions and, and laws and regulations and tax policies and, and electoral policies, international politics, um, terrorism. So you have a whole bunch of things that can, you know, impact market actors, impact businesses, impact investors. <clears throat> it's kind of problematic to focus you know, in research, focus in lectures on this whole broad set of, of issues. Um, I used to do it more myself, the broader uh, stuff, a few years ago, in particular when I did my, my PhD. But in, in later years, I've attempted to focus more on geopolitical risk as uh, in a international politics sense. So we can have a narrower definition of geopolitical risk. The risk affecting market actors that stems from interstate rivalry or conflict or cooperation or from other geostrategic moves undertaken by states attempting to influence events in other states. Hence the <clears throat> power struggle uh, among states. The attempts to use your resources as a state to affect other states' behavior, to realize the goals you have. Control and over territory, influence over territory, other territories that are governed by other actors. Uh, and that can be a lot of things, and I'll, I'll exemplify that during this uh, first lecture. The basic point is here that I've moved the course and my own research, uh, by the way, into the arena of international politics and away from institutional politics, away from, from domestic politics. Uh, but the area and the topic of political risk, in more generally, it encompasses a lot of, of uh, different subfields within, not only within uh, political science, but also within international political economy, business studies, and, and even history, sociology. So it's really, the <clears throat> field itself is really a sort of a bastard uh, field, if I may say so, um, which means that a lot of other courses can be useful if you want to pursue this topic of political risk further. But in this course, it's mostly, not exclusively, but mostly about geopolitical risk, about international politics, about big powers, medium-sized powers that, that deal with other states and sometimes with non-state actors. And this has sometimes, quite often actually, uh, economic consequences, consequences for business actors. <clears throat> okay, so who is affected by geopolitical risk? Who is affected by interstate conflict, by terrorism, by, by you know, states attempting to, to win out in negotiations, in, in uh, diplomatic quarrels, in, in uh, who is affected when a state institutes um, economic sanctions against other states, who is affected by geopolitical risk. And in general, you can say that international business and even domestic uh, businesses are affected by politics. Um, investors, uh, we have a group of investors called portfolio investors. These are short-term investors trying to, to, to maximize uh, profits by buying shares of stock in, in, in companies or buying bonds, which is effectively um, loaning money to governments. And these are also um, groups and individuals that are affected by political events and by international uh, politics. But by way of tradition, this course and, and by way of tradition, this, this uh, topic of political risk, geopolitical risk, it tends to focus on, on one particular actor, 
namely multinational corporations or multinational companies, as and some use the terms transnational companies. These are the corporations or companies that conduct foreign direct investment. There are particular kinds of companies because uh, they all they control assets in other countries. And these are really the actors we want to focus most. They deal with um, in business abroad, across borders. And you have some 195 uh, sovereign states and over 200 what we call um, national economies um, throughout the world. And you have a lot of trade, a lot of investment across borders. If you establish a firm in Norway and you export some good to other countries, that doesn't make you automatically a multinational company. So formally, you know, technically the definition of a multinational company is if you have a headquarter in one country and you establish a physical presence, an office or build a plant or have some direct activity abroad. And that may also means that when you're directly present in another country, um, you are affected by some peculiar and some special forces linked to you know, domestic politics, linked to the diplomatic relations between the country you invest in and other countries, etc. But you control a subsidiary or affiliate in another country. That's your business abroad. Um, so basically, if you have business in more than one country, you're a multinational company. And these MNCs or multinational corporations, they normally also have a long term perspective, which has some, you know, special consequences for uh, the way they can operate and the way they perceive risk long-term perspective because if you build something in another country if you build a plant if you if you try to extract oil you build large oil platforms um, then you don't get your money back you don't make a profit this year or the next year oil firms for instance uh, when you deal with oil exploration extraction production you think in, in terms of 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. And that means that you're, uh, you're likely to experience a lot of different issues uh, over that period before you can recoup your, your investment. You think long term. And if something dramatic, negative happens, you know, in the next year or in five years, you basically lose money. So investors, multinational corporations that deal with foreign direct investment, they tend to be more sensitive to a lot of political changes because they can't withdraw uh, after a year. Portfolio or short term investors, they can withdraw. Uh, if you buy, if you sit in your couch and you can you click on your computer and you can buy shares of stock in some company in another part of the world. If something dramatic politically happens uh, and you stand to lose from that investment, you can click on your mouse on your computer again and you can withdraw your funds because you haven't established a physical presence. Um, in that sense, it's more challenging, much more challenging often for a lot of these multinational companies. Uh, and that's really the, the issue here the mix, the interface between politics, international politics in particular, and these businesses with a long-term perspective. Um, and historically, uh, these businesses have often experienced political trouble. So that's really some of the essence of this course. Also down here, uh, what is characteristic in particular for the last few years or last couple of decades is that these companies have built up really complex supply chains and that increases the sensitivity of a lot of firms to to risk to politics 
And we have seen this quite clearly in the last year, last, you know, 18 months, perhaps, um, not least with the trade conflict between, in particular, China and the US. Uh, the institution of tariffs, and I'll get back to this example later in, in more detail, the institution of tariffs, which is really a tax on foreign trade, uh, that impacts a lot of firms, a lot of multinational corporations, a lot of domestic uh, corporations as, as well. Uh, but much more than those who are directly impacted by those tariffs, because it creates havoc, large and, and uh, sudden institutions of, of tariffs, creates havoc for a lot of companies um, in the sense that, you know, even if you don't have a presence in China, you might have a presence in South Korea or in Japan. These companies, they, they often make products that are composed of different parts that are sourced from different parts of the world. And I'll, I'll show a, a um, not this one, but one example of that. This is an iPhone. The mobile phone and the different components of that mobile phone are sourced from different parts of the world. Japan, South Korea, US, China, Switzerland, Germany. Uh, and if one or two of these countries engage in some diplomatic quarrels, conflicts, uh, and a trade conflict. And it's enough that one or two of these um, are engaged in such a conflict. Then it impacts a lot of these firms that source their, their um, source products from different parts of the world. And that we have seen quite clearly in uh, the recent trade conflict and still ongoing trade conflict between the US and China, that a lot of companies are affected. Not all of them dramatically. It's not that they go bust all of these companies. Uh, but in this sense, international business is more complex than it used to be. Geopolitical risk is more complex than it used to be. It used to be in a way easier uh, when you dealt with political risk issues in, in the 1970s, early 1970s. It was all about ideology, the Cold War. It was all about different economic models followed by different uh, countries. And you had a lot of what we refer to as nationalizations, expropriations, governments taking over your business because that's what their ideology uh, commands, or that's what the Cold War commands, uh, or that's um, what their economic, preferred economic model commands. But it was less of this, you know, complex supply chain where things are sourced from different parts of the world, and they're, they're um, and it's a good reason why they're, it's, it's often very efficient for companies to do it like that, as long as the investment environment is stable. And that's some of the key to recent events and probable um, future events and developments as well. That the stability that, that international business has gotten used to uh, in later decades, in particular since, since the end of the Cold War, that has kind of not disappeared, but it's become far less stable and far less predictable. So that will be some of the stuff I'm going to, to talk about in this course. Okay, at the bottom here, it's also of note that multinational corporations engage in a lot of this export and, and import. Um, so most, by far most of, of international trade, trade across borders, exports across borders, by far uh, the larger part of that totality is conducted by multinational corporations. 
so their key, their the 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 fundamental key to uh, international trade. They're the fundamental key, actually, to world prosperity. Uh, without trade, for instance, we'd all be poor because no country can produce uh, everything that country needs. There's a lot of international trade going on and it's absolutely necessary. Every country is dependent upon that. Even North Korea, even though that's the most secluded uh, probably country, country in the world, they depend on imports. They need oil. And then they need to export things to get the oil or to get other stuff that the country needs, that every country needs. Uh, and then they have to export something. Otherwise, you can't import. It has to balance, uh, balance out. So North Korea has to specialize in something like weapons production, missile production, um, and similar things. So, multinational corporations are responsible, I think it is, for about 80% of international trade, which is, which, uh, is a lot. Uh, and also, part, a big part of that trade is conducted within corporations, which is called intra-MNC trade or in, intra-company trade. You don't sell and buy things, you know, um, to other companies. It's within your own subsidiaries or affiliates. Um, but the basic point is that these are important actors, these are large actors, they have um, to a certain extent power, in particular when, when they deal with smaller countries that are often dependent upon um, the influx of foreign capital. Because foreign capital can create jobs, uh, they can ease the finances of the country in question. So that's another point in this whole geopolitical risk story that, that uh, it's often a lot of cooperation, of course, between multinationals and uh, what, we did, what we call host states, those that invite multinationals in. But there's also a lot of conflict. Um, but we can't cover everything in, in this course Anyway, just to continue a bit with, you know, multinationals, corpor uh, multinational corporations, FDI, which is foreign direct investment, um, we can ask what are the motives for FDI? What are the motives for FDI? I don't expect you to answer that because you're not present. Um, but basically to simplify, multinationals have they're present in other countries due to three different uh, factors. One is natural resources. So you have natural resource motivated FDI or foreign direct investment. Uh, if you're an oil company, you have to go abroad. So Equinor, the Norwegian oil company, they have really no choice or they had no choice when you know the, the company became too big um, the oil resources in Norway was expected to, to dwindle um, and the company which used to be called Statoil, they decided, I think it was in, in the early 1990s, that we need to go abroad. We will survive and we will prosper and grow as a company. We go abroad to where the resource, resources are found. So they went to Azerbaijan first. Uh, started in, in a joint venture, a cooperation with British Petroleum in Azerbaijan. And then they went to Angola and to Venezuela and to, to Nigeria and to all these countries that have often political complexities and challenges. But Equinor, which it has grown even further, they're still present. Sometimes they experience big trouble, and we'll talk about a case uh, later in this lecture. The big terrorist attack that, that uh, happened and affected Equinor um, in Algeria a few years ago. And they have other 
you know, experienced a lot of other trouble, which I will also briefly mention throughout the, the lecture series. If you want to explore for natural gas, it's the same. You have to go to the Middle East or to Russia or to, to some place where it's present. If, if, um, if you want to extract copper, you have to go to Chile or to Mongolia or to some place where that natural resource is. If you're an aluminium company like Hydro, Norway is a big uh, aluminium uh, country, um, really due to the energy resources, the natural, the, the, the waterfalls and the rivers, and which, which creates cheap energy because aluminium is, is, uh, is um, dependent upon really a lot of, of um, energy and, and preferably cheap energy. But Norsk Hydro or Norway doesn't have the natural resource that can be used in the, in the last instance to make aluminium. For that, you need bauxite which is this dirty black um, uh, stuff that, that uh, eventually is refined and then turned into aluminium. Then you need to go to Jamaica or you go to Guinea in Western Africa uh, or you might go to Australia, which also has a lot of bauxite. But there are only, the point is, you have only a few countries that have natural resources. If you need cobalt, which is used to make these, you know, some stuff in mobile phones and you, it's used to, to make batteries for electrical cars. You need often to go, or you, many companies need to go to Democratic Republic of the Congo. One of the most complex, politically, socially complex countries on earth in the middle of, of Africa. Ravaged by civil war, ravaged by corruption for a long time, ravaged by political instability. Um, but of course, these companies go there. The second motivation for foreign direct investment, or the main motivation, now we simplify, we say that you have natural resource motivation, and then secondly, you have market motivation. Multinational companies go to China and they have been going to China for many, many years. And the basic reason is that in China you will find 1.4 billion people and you'll find a market that grows because the Chinese economy since the late 1970s have grown with, you know, in an unprecedented way historically unprecedented, which means that people have more and more purchasing power. They can buy your stuff. If you're a car company, you want to, to sell these, you know, 50 million cars to China. And then you establish plants in China, a presence. Uh, so big markets and growing markets, they attract, you know, all these companies. Uh, and we know that from Norway as well, that, that, you know, China was the big thing, started to be a big thing in the 1990s, 10, 12, 13 years ago, it was starting to really be a big thing. You had to go to China. And now you feel you absolutely have to go to China. But at the same time, now you have these political tensions, which, which uh, make it a little bit uh, difficult. Okay. The third main motivation for FDI is, you know, efficiency seeking, which is really cost reducing. And typically it's, it's about, you know, uh, if your company is labor intensive or deal with, you know, labor intensive production, you go to countries where labor is cheap, wages are low. You can't produce anything labor intensive almost, at least in Norway because wages are high. We're a rich country with relatively high degree of economic equality. So if we take, for example, Norway had used to have and, and still to a certain extent has a big, you know, important furniture in industry, several furniture companies, which used to produce stuff in Norway. Uh, but many years ago, they couldn't do that anymore because they were out-competed internationally, because wages were too, too high. It takes a lot of hands, a lot of labor to, to make this furniture. So, so the, 
uh, established plants in Lithuania, in Estonia, Latvia, Poland, countries that were either in already in the EU European Union or were about to enter into the EU, which meant that you know if you if you establish production in these countries, you don't have to to pay tariffs um, to sell your goods in other EU countries. At the same time as wage the wage level in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and other countries as well, in particular in Eastern Europe, if we talk about the European context, uh, you get access to the EU market and you get low wages. They had to do that, otherwise they would be outcompeted in a competitive international marketplace and competitive international um, environment. Um, and of course, you know, other countries, other companies, clothing companies, they go to Southeast Asia. They go to Indonesia, Cambodia, Bangladesh to, to produce because they need a lot of labor. And labor is costly in rich countries, countries rich in technology, rich in terms of, of the wages that, that are paid, rich in terms of capital. Um, so that's really the third you know, main motivation for FDI. I'll show a couple of figures as well, uh, just to establish the trajectory of the world economy and um, just to create a basis for what I'll talk about later, you know, some changes in the international environment in international politics. The first figure is about, uh, it concerns world FDI stock and world merchandise exports, 1990-2019. And numbers are not really, uh, the absolute numbers are not really that important, but it's about, if we look at the upper here, it's <clears throat> 40 trillion it is, 40 trillion US dollars worth of foreign direct investment stock, or almost that in 2019. 40 trillion US dollars. Um, <clears throat> world FDI stock, just to explain that, foreign direct investment, the total value of everything that foreign companies own in other countries. So if you have a headquarter in Belgium and you and you have some business, some values, some plants in some assets, as we, we call them in Switzerland, that's counted, you know, as part of this FDI, FDI stock. To a certain extent, it's accumulated assets abroad. Um, and the point here is really the shape of the graph, because if we go down here to 1990, and that's basically the end of the Cold War, uh, and on Christmas Day 1992, the Soviet Union was, was history dissolved. Uh, and that changed a lot of this, you know, framework, these possibilities of for international business, and, and it changed international politics and international business. Opportunities became greater. Uh, and the Western countries could really devise and shape um, a world order. They could shape the rules of the game not only in politics, but also in international business. That created a really strong level or high level of stability and opportunity and stable rules. And I'll get back to some of these, you know, changes later in, in, in the lecture series, what has changed in, in international politics. But to, to take the short story, uh, short version of the story, uh, during the Cold War from, from about, you know, 1946, 47, and until the late 80s and early 90s, it was really two world orders, two, you know, big camps, 
one bigger than the other though, uh, led by respectively the United States and the Soviet Union. And these devised their own, uh, they had their own preferences with regards to how uh, the international economy should be governed. You had the capitalist model of the US basically and you had the anti-capitalist model of the Soviet Union. And due to you know several developments, economic and political developments and military developments, the Soviet Union ran into a lot of trouble and the Cold War ended without a bang. It ended relatively peacefully. And one might say that the US and the West won. And then you had this period of stability or relative stability, which is kind of unfair to all these, you know, countries. And, and you had the, the countries um, which, which used to be, to be um, in Yugoslavia, you had the Yugoslav wars and, and you had a lot of, of, of uh, wars in that period and a lot of civil wars. So, so uh, but basically the rules of the game, how, what is, how should the, the international e economy be structured? Uh, what should be the rules, the economic institutions? These things were stable. And, and this framework, international political and international economic framework was shaped by the biggest and strongest countries in the world. And these biggest and strongest countries were the US and then the US friends and allies. So that made for a relatively stable period of growth in foreign direct investment and also growth in the exports and imports of goods, international trade, world merchandise exports which has kind of flattened out uh, lately. Uh, but the basic point is that the post-Cold War period was a period which was very beneficial for multinational companies, international businesses. And that is a period that is about to change. The direction is changing. And, and that we will, we will uh, talk about a lot in these lectures. What has changed? Why has it changed? Can we expect, you know, a reversal or a flattening out of these trends? Or can we expect international trade and investment or globalization, economic globalization, to use this um, other term? Can we expect this to rise and rise and rise? Can we expect this blue thing here to rise and rise and rise? Um, so we'll return to that as well later. Okay, and yet another graph, and this is um, this shows FDI flows between 2014 and 2019 by region or group of countries. So you have the, uh, and I use the UN um, grouping of, of countries, developed economies is the blue one here. Uh, really high numbers of, of flows and this include the uh, most European countries, EU countries, uh, Norway, uh, the US, Canada, it includes uh, Japan, a developed economy, Australia, New Zealand and, and, and um, basically the, the richest countries or most of, of the richest countries. FDI flows is another term. So I showed you the last slide, FDI stocks. FDI stocks is the accumulated value, basically, of, of all that has been invested by multinational companies abroad. Um, and then you subtract some, you know, devaluation of the assets you own because they, as the years pass by, they become less and less valuable often. Uh, but it's basically accumulated foreign direct investment. Flows, on the other hand, FDI flows, it counts the, the measure counts the new investment that is conducted in a given year. So flows are uh, then normally lower than stocks because stocks are accumulated FDI flows, basically. Anyway, those who have received most FDI in that period is, you know, those are the rich countries. 
um, and the rich, you know, the developed economies. And then you have the Asian countries, including China, which is kind of, you know, less. And then you go down to Latin America and the Caribbean. And then we know that Africa, which is the red one, uh, has never attracted big absolute amounts of foreign direct investment. For specific reasons, and political risk is, is uh, one of them, lack of, of fully developed markets is another. I think the basic point here, and it's not only about FDI, it's about exports, it's about imports, it's about GDP or gross uh, domestic product, it's about the strength of the economies. Um, and what has long been the case, and even if you go 200 years back, um, because then you had this, this um, before that, before the early eight, uh, 1800s, there were a relatively, a relatively high degree of economic equality among nations. So the European nations, for instance, were not really that much richer than the Asian nations or African nations for, for that matter. Uh, and then things changed. You had the Industrial Revolution, part one, part two, uh, and you had the first phase of globalization uh, over 100 uh, years ago, late 1800s, early uh, 1900s. And they took off the Western economies. And they're, they're still, you know, among the biggest, the European economy, the EU accounts for almost a quarter of, of total the value of the total production of goods and services in the world. The U.S. accounts for almost another quarter. But then you have the growth of Asia, which is kind of the big, and in particular China, which is kind of a big, um, the big story in international politics and international political economy, international economy, uh, the growth of China and the growth of Asia. So, so, um, so in terms of the strength of economies, of national economies, you know, things have moved eastward. So now you have Europe as a really important economic uh, actor still. You have the US or North America as a really important actor. And now you have certain Asian economies that are really important. And this has some implications for a lot of things. Uh, which is also uh, a topic for this lecture series. <clears throat> Other regions are less important, relatively speaking. That's the way it is um, now. Africa is relatively less important overall. And that's also why, for instance, the United States, which is the strongest power still in terms of, of uh, military strength in particular, but also economic strength and, and influence in the world, the U.S. tends to focus less, far less on African matters than on matters that has to do with Asia or with Europe. Um, so, and the same goes for Latin America and the Caribbean. It's kind of semi-secluded and it's, it's um, um, I'm perhaps exaggerating a bit, uh, but you do have sort of a hierarchy when it comes to the importance of different regions um, or the perceived importance. And it is often linked to economic strength and to economic potential. And this is also reflected by, you know, the flows of foreign direct investment that certain regions uh, still get a lot. And a lot of countries that really need some investment and some, <coughs> you know, foreign companies, introduction of foreign companies, they don't get the capital uh, they, they really need. Um, that's kind of paradoxical uh, or rather unfortunate. Um, but FDI tends to, to still go to rich countries. That's the overall um, picture. And lastly, before I take a break, just quickly, I can uh, show you the, 
what kind of you know particular firms are we often talk talking about when it comes to multinational companies and this this is a list of the largest multinationals, non-financial, so you don't count here banks and, and uh, insurance companies. And this is measured by uh, the amount of, of their value of foreign assets, what they own, the value of what they own abroad, uh, measured in million uh, US dollars. So, so that's, for instance, 343 billion <clears throat> billion US dollars, which Royal Dutch, Dutch Shell controls, the petroleum company, oil company. And you often find oil companies, you often find car companies uh, that tend to have to go abroad and they own a lot. They own plants, oil exploration, um, oil platforms and, and stuff, telecom companies. And, and you know a lot of these names on the list. But these are not the only ones, far from it. And, and you have tens of thousands of, of multinational companies, big and small, around the world. And they own perhaps, you know, a million subsidiaries or different smaller businesses around the world. So this is really, you know, the, the backbone or skeleton in, of the international economy. Multinational companies and their investments abroad. Okay, I'll take a little break now, um, and I hope this recording works, and then I'll, I'll get back to the second part.